Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Mike and I are here with SITREP's Ukraine reporter, Simon Newton, who's just back from the country. We'll hear all about what he saw and what he got up to, including this conversation with former heavyweight boxing champion, now mayor of Kyiv, Vitaly Klitschko. We don't have another choice. We have to fight. Ready or not, nobody wants to fight. Nobody wants to die. But we don't have so many choices. We have to fight. Also on SITREP, as tensions remain high in the Middle East, Britain deploys a Type 45 destroyer HMS Diamond to the Gulf. And America sends the USS Eisenhower through the Strait of Hormuz. SITREP looks at how aircraft carriers are used to deploy both hard and soft power. And here's from the commanding officer of the UK's biggest warship, HMS Prince of Wales. We've completed over 150 landings of the F-35 and now looking further ahead as we return back to Portsmouth, it'll be the longest this ship has been deployed for over 100 days from UK waters. Sitrep with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Hello, Mike. Uh, Simon, welcome back. Uh, you yeah, left okay. Ukraine. Hi. Uh, Simon, welcome back. Um, you left Ukraine just after Russia's biggest drone attack on Kyiv since the full-scale invasion. Yeah, it was a, it was a six-hour attack. Um, the Russians sent 75 drones. It, it, we got a sort of alert on our app to tell us that it, that it had begun. It, it lasted, say, for six hours. Most of the drones, I think all but one, are actually shot down. And it was, as you say, the largest air, air attack, drone attack since the invasion started. Um, we, were in, we were in the air raid shelter. Um, there was damage to some buildings, I think largely caused by the debris, but not by no, no injuries, thankfully. And um, yeah, it was just um, fascinating to be there for this, you know, because the locals really ignore these alerts to, to all intents and purposes. Now they just go on with their lives. Um, and, and I actually had a chance to talk to the mayor of, uh, of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, about this and what the city is expecting as it goes into the wintertime as the Russians try and hit these, these vital water, power and heating supplies. Right now we prepare for the next winter and uh, we expect next attack in the wintertime to our critical infrastructure. And that's why we prepare. Thank you for our partners. Uh, we protect it right now better than last year because we received modern anti-missile system from our partners and last uh, couple of last attack to our hometown, we shoot down every uh, drone, every Russian rockets. Right now, if you go outside of this building, here to the streets, you have illusion of peace. Uh, the people go on the streets, uh, they open in the cafe, restaurants, bars and uh, lives going on. But never forget uh, a couple of hundred kilometers east or south is real hell. Will to win is very important, spirit also very important, but we need modern weapons. And that's why I want to say thank you very much, and we need more. I wonder if you have a message for the members of the British military that are assisting Ukraine. We very appreciate for our partners, especially for Great Britain. Great Britain make huge support, deliver defensive weapons, uh, anti-missile system, uh, make a training for our soldiers uh, uh, to help to us with humanitarian help. Uh, financial support is very, very important, life important, critical important for us. And that's why I, I will be never tired to tell a thousand times, thank you. Do you think Ukraine is prepared for a long war because it looks as if it will be a long war? Ready to long fight, we don't have another choice. We have to fight. Ready or not, nobody wants to fight. No, nobody wants to die. But we, doesn't have, we don't have uh, so many choices. We have to fight. We have to defend the future of our children. Free future. Democratic future. Democratic future of our country, and uh, that's why uh, we hope. I'm more than sure right now for the new year, it's uh, our tradition to make a wishes for the next year. I'm more than sure that every Ukrainian have just one most important wishes for next year. The peace coming back. We hope the next year peace coming back to our homeland. A message of defiance there from Mayor Klitschko, Simon. Um, but how widespread is that view, do you find? Well, we were obviously, we were in Kyiv, so we were meeting people who stayed 
behind it's obviously shapes their their view of things i think it's three million or so people in the city at the moment uh, it went down to a million when the invasion happened and you know many of them have come back and i think there's also four hundred thousand or so refugees living there so the ones we spoke to definitely were defiant um but of course that that isn't the case with everyone there are there are reports that i think about twenty thousand men have actually fled since the start of the war many to moldova and you and i heard stories when talking to ukrainians about how you can buy your way out of the draft you know if you have enough mm-hmm. rivna and if you can get this white chit as they call it to get yourself out of uh, being called up so it is an issue in society certainly where we were there was defiance but there there is a split in ukrainian society i think that you do hear about between those who've left and those who've stayed Interesting. Um, Mike, um, what do we know about Russia's missile stocks and why they're using so many of these Iranian-made Shahid drones, That the ones that we saw in that massive onslaught on Kyiv? Yes, they, they've been conserving their missile stocks, particularly the ballistic missiles, and we think there's a, a good 1,500 or so that they've stockpiled immediately. And they're using the Shahid drones, these Iranian Shahid 136 drones, in big attacks, as Simon obviously witnessed, you know, 70-odd uh, at a time, in order, we think, to exhaust the defensive missiles that the Ukrainians have got. So they're using up their ammunition because they're having to use, you know, more expensive missile and anti-aircraft missiles against pretty cheap drones. And so these Shahids, I mean, the Russians know that they don't really get through. Most of them get shot down, but they're just using up uh, Ukrainian defensive stocks. And the the big attacks will start now. I mean, they've already really begun. But the Russians are make are going to make a big effort this winter to really attack the infrastructure of Ukraine much more directly than they did last year. That's the general assessment. And Simon, we're going to hear more later about the civilians in Ukraine who are being uh-huh. involved in drone testing. But you did discuss the issue of weapon production with the Ukrainian minister. Yeah, we also did an interview with um, Alexander Kamishin, who is a, a member of Zelensky's cabinet. He's a very distinctive chap. He's, I think, he's only 39 years old. He used to run Ukraine's railway system. Very distinctive chap, as I say, with he's got this sort of mohawk haircut and uh, not your average politician. And he's, he's the man tasked with turbocharging Ukraine's homegrown, you know, its sovereign defense industries to try and get their own weapons uh, rather than relying so heavily on on, uh, on their partners. Uh, I asked him what were the top priorities when it comes to weapons and equipment that Ukraine needs. We set the priorities like air defense, ammunition, drones, armored vehicles. That's, say, top four priorities. But finally, indeed, we can't say that we don't need breaching equipment. We can't say that we don't need missiles. We can't say that we don't need all the rest of the long list of weapon and ammunition. So finally, definitely, we are building the capacity for the whole range of ammunition and weapons. I know procurement isn't your necessarily your field. Thanks, God. <laughs> but um, just in a general sense, the UK contribution to your war effort with Storm Shadow and End Law and everything, I mean, how big and how grateful is Ukraine being for that help? That's something we constantly speak with my president, with uh, MOD, with other people in the team, that we say that we would be never uh, enough thankful for what you and your country already done for my country. Thanks for that. And indeed, we will stand in this war for 637 days, only because you are with us and other countries of the free world. I'm just after a sense of how much ammunition you are using, you know, your military is getting through. I've seen different figures. I think the Americans said at one point it was 90,000 155s a month. Then I think your own defense minister said it was 250,000. I mean, how much, I mean, just to give me a sense of how much you're using. The sense would be the following. The whole world's, the free world production capability is not enough. That's why this war would be always about warehouses as well. And that's why I say that we would be always relying on our partners as well. And you can hear in there, he's very much looking ahead as well till after this war. He's talking about Ukraine developing tech, you know, becoming a tech hub really they're actually testing this stuff in real combat in just weeks unlike you know the, our traditional procurement cycle and, and he's saying that yeah. they will be willing to share the lessons they learned from this war particularly the way that they've transferred from soviet area era to, to nato standard weaponry we talked about bae and babcock them you know, opening offices in uh, in ukraine as well 
you know, forge these links, make them tighter. And he you know, really believes that Ukraine's defense industry can sort of supercharge the country's economy down the line when hopefully this war is at an end. It would be really interesting to watch this developing. Mike, the, the UK government has given Ukraine £4.6 billion in military aid so far and trained more than 50,000 soldiers as part of Operation Orbital. Defence Minister James Heapy said in the Commons, international partners, including the UK, are working with Ukraine to further strengthen its defences. What further expertise might they offer as the war changes and as lessons are learnt about combat? Well, um, Britain has sent quite a lot of equipment uh, to Ukraine. And to be honest, I don't think there's that much more equipment that we can send of, of real use to Ukraine. But my goodness, there's quite a lot of expertise. We're providing you know, training, uh, basic infantry training, but there's much more specialised expertise, particularly over combined arms uh, manoeuvre warfare. That sort of expertise is something that we really could uh, still make a big contribution towards uh, Ukraine's war effort with. And Simon, as promised, we've heard a lot on SIPRET about the importance of drone warfare to the conflict, but how and where are potential new models tested in Ukraine? Yeah, so this was also really interesting because you don't really think about the testing side. You just think about them using them. You know, we've all seen those videos on, you know, on, online of them hitting tanks with, uh, with drones. They actually have a, a, a load of voluntary organizations that test these drones before they're flown because they're obviously different. Um, we, were, we were taken to a field uh, away from Kiev. It was minus five where we, where we arrived. When we arrived, it was snowing. And uh, you know, there's a whole field of people testing these drones. This is, this is what it sounded like. So you can hear there's a, there's a, it was basically a group of engineers. These were, these were volunteers, really. Um, they work for a, a voluntary organization. And what they were saying that, you know, some of the drones that they're receiving are better made than others. Some of them are made in, you know, much better sort of small factories than others. Uh, they're very worried, for instance, that some of them, the, the actual munition on the bottom of them has fallen off previously when, when these drone pilots were taking off and a number have actually been killed. So that's one of the things they definitely test before they, uh, they send them to the front line. This was uh, Maxim, who is, Maxim sorry, who is the engineer in charge. Each drone will, must be tested okay. on a long range also with payload, also with uh, all fly capabilities. And not only test, we also like producing these drones, uh, but testing of the drone is most important part. You've, you've seen the drones develop throughout yeah. this war in terms of it's an accelerator of the technology and you're fighting a technology war with the Russian army too because they also develop drones as well. Yes, actually, to be honest, we are starting to lose in with manufacturing of, uh, in this war. We are produced small and small number if you compare with Russian. Uh, Russian produce thousands and thousands per week of every types of the drones. Also, the border are open with China. The border are open. You can easily to buy all components what you really need. Simon, what did he have to say about the different types of drones they're testing? So there was there was large drones, there was fixed wing drones there, quadcopters all, all being tested, some able to carry um, up to up to 20 kilograms. I think the first one you heard there was actually a very large quadcopter that they use. It it's only, only flies at night because it is so big and so large and it's got this very powerful thermal camera on it. Um, and I asked Maxim about the impact he and his engineers feel personally that they're having on this war. For engineers, we all understand that our rifles is our brain and we understand how to win in this war with our brains. And just finally, tell me about your volunteers here. These are, these are young guys who are maybe have done engineering at university and they're using those skills a to... Lot, a lot of our guys are volunteers, a lot of our guys are actually students. Simon, really interesting to hear that. Um, um, I know you're going to be going back as soon as you can. Thank you so much for, for giving us that little update on, on your trip Pleasure. there. News, discussions and analysis. This is Zitrap. Now, the news that the USS Eisenhower has sailed along with her carrier group through the Strait of Hormuz into the Gulf as tensions remain high in the Middle East and the UK is to send HMS Diamond, a Type 45 destroyer, to join the frigate HMS Lancaster there, underline how key navies are to projecting both soft 
and hard power. Britain's biggest warship, HMS Prince of Wales, has been deployed since September off the eastern seaboard of the United States, training alongside US forces and pushing the limits of carrier operations with drones and aircraft trials. They include more than 150 deck landings of F-35B stealth fighters. F-35s have also reached what's been dubbed beast mode, the heaviest takeoff weight for a fully loaded fighter from a Queen Elizabeth class carrier. The ship will return to the UK by Christmas after taking part in Westland 23. Captain Richard Hewitt, commanding officer of HMS Prince of Wales, says there have been several highlights of the deployment so far. Well, deploying in any Royal Naval warship is, is a very special moment and is rewarding both for myself and the ship's company. Um, in the time of Prince of Wales, deploying for Westland 23, that has included many firsts, whether it be taking the F-35 through um, its next advancement as part of development testing three, and also autonomy and the two uncrewed vessels we've both launched and recovered to Prince of Wales during our three and a half month deployments. In the case of numbers, there's many firsts. It's our thousandth landing we've completed during Western 23, which in total is 3,000 landings in Prince of Wales' lifetime. We've completed over 150 landings of the um, F-35, uh, and now looking further ahead, as we return back to Portsmouth, it'll be the longest this ship has been deployed for over 100 days from UK waters. The deployment had been delayed after the carrier went into dry dock while repairs were carried out after it broke down near the Isle of Wight last year. Captain Hewitt again. So Prince of Wales remained in dry dock for just under eight months, which actually relative to the life of the ship, which this ship will be in commission for 50 years, is a relatively short period. The time spent there was to correct a mechanical defect, but the time was not wasted. Eight months was also spent correcting and rectifying that defect, but also enhancing Prince of Wales' capability for Westland 23, and more importantly, when she assumes the fleet flagship role and the very high readiness carrier for the Royal Navy. Well, Commodore Roger Redwin is the UK naval attaché to the USA. He sat down earlier with our reporter, James Hurst. Visits like and deployments like HMS Prince of Wales bring massive opportunity to the bilateral relationship between our two countries, and in particular the United States Navy, US Marine Corps, the Royal Navy, and with the Royal Marines. And of course, deployments like this do take a lot of energy, both at the strategic level, but it's really at the activity level where we're seeing a lot of experimental trials and, and training and development. And I think that's a success here that the ship has delivered over the last three months. We'll talk more about that strategic level. But yeah, let's talk about what has been achieved, because as you say, they've been pushing the envelope a bit. So HMS Prince of Wales uh, was, well, it has been here conducting the development trials for the F-35B. This really is to try take the aircraft, a fifth generation aircraft with a fifth generation carrier, and optimise that capability as we work this ship up, ultimately for a head mark of Carrier Strike Group Deployment 2025. And in doing so, they've, they've taken these really niche uh, F-35 airframes on the east coast of the US, which have all sorts of instruments in, embedded in them to work out you know, where they can exploit the envelope going ahead. And really, it's all about lethality. It's about how do we take this capability and exploit it on the platform. And for example, uh, there was a thing you probably read in the press recently called the beast mode. What does that mean? Well, it means taking the aircraft off with maximum weight of weapons, fuel, in order to really exploit the capability once it's airborne. So really, it's been an integration uh, at trials, but also really taking our F-35B to full operational capability. And some of that you can only do with bespoke trials. It, this is not easy stuff. The team on board make it look really easy. But of course, it's really hard work to integrate this capability and exploit it and, and operate it to the edge of its envelope. So has that been making use of American F-35s to push further what we might be able to do with our own in the future? So it's a collaborative program. And the, the, the work with the US pilots, Royal Navy pilots, is all about this uh, interoperability leading to interchangeability between our navies. And of course, what we're trying to do is ensure that when our ships, and in this case, the Queen Elizabeth class carriers, are deployed, say, in the Indo-Pacific in a few years' time, you can integrate both US Marine Corps uh, F-35Bs alongside the UK variants as well. And so it's about the interchangeability journey. And that's why driving these trials, the development trials are really important because we've, do, we've been doing some stuff uniquely for the first time. One example is this short roll-on vertical landing. 
And that really is, again, about the, the aircraft coming back, doing a, a niche landing capability onto the ship, which ultimately in the day is going to expand its capability and lethality. So it's, it's a, it's a two-way process where, we've been, where the ship has been experimenting, but also due to its location. We've also been supporting the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps, 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit, with some of their generation capabilities, with some of their units landing on the ship, which goes back to this incredible relationship between the U.K. and U.S., under the carrier strike statement of intent, which was refreshed and resounded out by the ministers, Secretary Austin and uh, the former Secretary of State Wallace in the spring of this year. Does this improve our capability to operate our aircraft carriers on our own, or is it, is it purely about improving our capability while working alongside the Americans? I think the, the honest answer is both. It allows us to exploit and, and take our sovereign capability to that next level. As I said earlier, it's about optimising this fifth-generation aircraft with this fifth-generation carrier. And, of course, it's, it's just not the aircraft on the deck and the integration with the US. It's also the ship's company. All those different moving parts of people, equipment, the training, the sustainability, which fuses this capability into, obviously, the pointy end. And it's often we get distracted just thinking about the aircraft, but having visited HMS Prince of Wales only last week, and recently with uh, the First Sea Lord, the Chief of Naval Operations, and the Commandant U.S. Marine Corps. It's an incredible machine, incredible ship, but it's the people which bring that asymmetric advantage together. So the answer is yes, but it's also enabled by uh, an incredibly motivated uh, bunch of people, sailors and aviators. The message that some people choose to take from, from that stress on interoperability is that we're not capable of it achieving significant carrier strike power on our own. So I think it's worth going back to December 2014. And why do I go back to December 2014? Because this is where the delivery of combined sea power was conceived. But then First Sea Lord and then Chief of Naval Operations realised that in order to be a, uh, credible partners to each other, we need to ensure there's a low-bearing framework which fuses our outputs together. And the strength of our relationship is founded on this load-bearing framework where our outputs and are complementary. We're not dependent, it's complementary. How much impact does a, a visit like this, a, a deployment like this of the Prince of Wales, have for our wider defence relationship with the United States? I think it's a great question because we can cover from the soft power right up to the hard power. And I've probably been focusing a lot on the hard power, but the soft power, the convening power of a Royal Navy warship with the white ensign flying has, has an amazing, as I said, convening power. We saw already in, in, in the US, the, the aircraft carrier hosted the ambassador, British ambassador, Dame Karen Pierce, where she hosted a, a, a reception. Where, of course, when you're bringing your NATO friends, your American audience, it's a, an opportunity for, um, for people to come and, and have a conversation about the 21st century challenges. So the soft power from this incredible ship, uh, the men and women on board are amazing ambassadors, not just for the Royal Navy, but for the United Kingdom. Because it can be tempting to look and go, the US has got 11 aircraft carriers, really big beasts. We've got two, you know, how, how much can we, can we actually mean to them with our, with our two aircraft carriers? The United States Navy uh, and the US values the contribution of, of these Queen Elizabeth Royal Navy aircraft carriers. They are 70,000 tons. They carry fifth-generation uh, fighters. Their integration, as I said, driving towards interchangeability to the US is, is a realized ambition. They add value. So when it comes to a fight, what we have is a, is a night one, day one capability, which the allies and partners strand of the United States strategy that's a credible ally and partner. So there's a lot of energy that goes into this very complex activity of carrier strike, which the ship's company of HMS Prince of Wales make it look very, very easy because they, they live and breathe it all the time. But this is not easy. This is, this is degree level integration. You know, they're optimizing a fifth generation aircraft carrier with a fifth generation aircraft, with arguably a fifth generation ship's company in order to make sure that we continue to be a trusted and credible ally and partner into the 21st century, which we are doing.
Commodore Roger Redwin speaking to James Hurst there. Uh, Mike, let's start with the Prince of Wales. She's leading a carrier strike group to the Indo-Pacific in 2025. How far off is she from becoming fully operational? Uh, not far. I mean, it's during next year, she will become fully operational in time for this proper Indo-Pacific deployment, which will mirror the deployment, of course, of Queen, of Queen Elizabeth uh, carrier, which was very successful. I mean, other than the, you know, that mishap in the Mediterranean on the way back when a, an F-35 trying to take off fell off the end of the, mm. of the, yeah. of the ship. Uh, but that was, that was the only problem. Otherwise, that was a very, very successful tour, which was quite hazardous. And I think the Prince of Wales will try to do the same in 2025. A big world tour, which will you know accomplish a series of things. I, I mean, full operational capability isn't just the the ship itself. I mean, as Commodore Redwin was saying there, really, it's it's the crew. I mean, we haven't been in the big carrier business since the 1960s. You know, we haven't operated these size carriers. We lost a lot of the skills and abilities. Although we had our our mini carriers, our 22,000 ton carriers, um, we haven't operated carriers at this size for a couple of generations. And a lot of it um, is a about the, the you know it's the flesh and blood and imagination that you put into it it's not just the the steel and the technology and it's interesting you know that uh, Commodore Redwin then he said 70,000 ton carriers do you know they were advertised as 65,000 ton carriers they oh. were designed as 65,000 tons and I have it on very good authority that when they launch the Queen Elizabeth it's only when you get them in the water can you really weigh wait. them <laughs> that's right only in the water with the displacement then you find out it turns out they were 5,000 tons over so both of oh, them are 70,000 ton carriers we're only supposed to have 65,000 thousand tons but we've got 70,000 which is good because the you know the more yeah. tonnage the more the more you can get on it as it were the more you can have so there it is it will be fully operational next year that's as much about the crew as the ship itself and I think it'll probably go on a pretty successful tour in 2025 if if by that time we don't need it to do some fighting for now, the Americans have sent their carrier strike group led by USS Eisenhower, or Ike, as she's known, through the Strait of Hormuz into the Gulf. And now Britain is sending HMS Diamond, a Type 45 destroyer there, to join the frigate HMS Lancaster. There have been missiles, though, Mike, fired from Houthi rebels in Yemen towards US ships in the region after attempted hijackings of civilian vessels. How tricky or otherwise is it for a carrier to operate in, in these relatively narrow straits where tensions are high. Yeah, and they're getting higher all the time. The Eisenhower, with its carrier battle group, has gone through the Strait of Hormuz, to my surprise, I have to say, um, mm. because there's not a whole lot of sea room once you get west of the Strait of Hormuz. I mean, there are 500 ships a day coming in and out of the Straits, and so there's a sort of an up lane and a down lane because the depth isn't great either. So the, the, the depth that, that will take big ships of this size are, is not so wide. And, I mean, certainly you can, you know, you move in and out, but, I mean, if a carrier had to manoeuvre at high speed, speed quickly and there's not a whole lot of sea room to do it in so you know putting the Eisenhower where it is right in the gulf is a clear message to Tehran that we're not mm. frightened of you and it, the same goes for the Red Sea as you say there have been um, uh, missile launches um, from Houthi rebels in Yemen which have been intercepted uh, by the uh, I see the Kani again was in action the USS Kani which is part of the uh, the Ford carry battle group which is up in the Mediterranean but the Kani's in the Red Sea the US has also got the Bataan which is a helicopter carry in the Red Sea and the Mason the USS Mason was involved in first of all arresting five Somali pirates who boarded the the Central Park which is a chemical carrier and they, they arrested these pirates and then a couple of hours later the Houthis fired a couple of missiles at them um, mm. so there's a lot of tension we, we're all focused on Gaza of course but as part of the Gaza crisis there's rising tension in the Gulf and the Red Sea mainly of a of a naval character and here we are with the, with the United States ships shooting down missiles in defense of Israel you know, and yeah. that is not lost on Tehran or on other or capitals in the Arab world. I mean, the United States is getting pulled into this. It's trying to be careful. It's not responding to so many attacks on its forces that are happening on an almost daily basis. But increasingly, you know, tension in the Gulf is rising. And, you know, HMS Diamond will, I think, will find itself having quite a role to play. I mean, interestingly, it's a guided missile carrier. It's there for air defence. It might find itself doing a certain amount of it. So that, that, that is the reason for its deployment, is it? Is that the thinking behind it? it. I think it is, yes. I mean, it's, it's partly to, to bolster Lancaster, which is there as a frigate. But I mean, the, you know, the air battle 
over the southern part of, of Arabia, if you like, the Arabian Gulf and the bottom of the Red Sea. That's becoming more intensive. And I think that Diamond may find itself, as it were, involved in that. But certainly it's a, it's a symbol of the fact that we are taking this seriously as well and that we want to be with our United States allies. If they need to do it, then we need to do it. I think that's the message. Mike, great to speak to you. Thank you for your time today. And thanks to all of our guests. That is it for now. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back with another sit rep next Thursday. For now, though, from me, Kate Chibbo. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.